Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My name is Eun Siu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. It is my great joy to welcome you to our worship service at the Vine on online campus of Riceville United Methodist Church. No matter where you are joining us from, we cherish your presence with us today. We have embarked on our Love Your Neighbor Kindness campaign during this election season. In a time that we can often feel divided, we are reminded that God calls us to be instruments of grace and love. So this campaign is an invitation to embody Christ's love and grace through the simple act of kindness. You can find more details about this campaign through our Facebook, Instagram, and website. I hope you all join us this in campaign so that we can spread out God's love throughout this community and also around this world. Beloved Riceville, now let us prepare our hearts before God. Take a deep breath and feel closer to our Lord. Please join me in our opening congregational prayer. You can find the words on the, your screen. Gracious God, give to us the mind of Christ, who loved God and loved his neighbor, who healed the sick, fed the hungry, and prayed for the forgiveness of those who rejected him. May we follow his path in this life and the life to come. Amen. Let us go before God in our prayer. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, thank you for gathering us in your presence today. We come with open hearts, ready to grow in faith and love. We give thanks for this sacred space and moment where we can pass from the business of life to listen for your voice and be reminded of your call to love one another. As we have embarked on our Love Your Neighbor Kindness campaign, fill us with the same spirit of kindness and love that Jesus showed. Inspire us to see the needs of those around us, not just with our eyes, but with your heart. Help us to be the hands and feet of your love in the world. May each act of kindness ripple out showing the world the power of love and compassion that comes from knowing you. Lord, in this season of elections and decisions, grant us wisdom, patience, and understanding. May we engage with one another with grace, listening deeply to the concerns of our neighbors. Lead us away from division and toward unity, reminding us that Despite our differences, we are all your children, called to love one another as you have loved us. And now we lift before you those whom we name with our voices or hold silently in our hearts.
Lord, hear our prayers. As we lift these prayers to you, remind us that you hear each cry, each hope, and each need. Surround those we have named and those we hold in silence with your peace, strength, and healing presence. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our hearts and gift. As we respond to God's grace and generosity, you can contribute to the ministry of Ricefield United Methodist Church via mail or a website. Let us continue to worship God. Riceville kids, how are you today? I'm Pastor Eunseo and I'm happy to share this time with y'all. So I have a question for you. Have you ever gone on a trip with your family? How was it? Was it fun? Adventurous? Well, in today's Bible story, Jesus went on a trip with his family when he was around 12 years old. Jesus and, and his family traveled to the temple for a special holiday. It was like a going to church um, on a special occasion, only their church was not right in town. So they had to take a long journey to get there. Anyway, after having a great celebration and they were on their way home, Mary and Joseph, Jesus' parents, they realized that Jesus was not with their travel group. So they were so panicked. And they spent days to um, look for Jesus. And finally, they made it back to the temple. And you know what? Jesus was there in the temple. He had been there the whole time talking with the leaders of church. Well, even though he was still a child, just 12, year, 12 years old boy, he really loved learning about God and had lots of questions. So it's like when you ask questions in Sunday school or to your parents about things you are very curious about, Jesus did do. When Mary and Joseph finally um, find Jesus, Mary was very upset and asked him, why did you stay behind? But Jesus was not worried. He said, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I must be in my father's house? Well, you know, he was exactly where he was supposed to be, learning and talking about God. Just like Jesus, we can learn so much when we are in God's house, this church. Church is not just a place where we sing a song or hang out with friends. Actually, it is also a place where we can ask questions, learn together, and share our thoughts. And Jesus shows us no matter um, how old we are, learning about God is something we can do all the time. So what can we learn from Jesus today? First of all, beloved Riceville kids, it is okay to ask so many questions about God if you have any kind of questions. Please don't be afraid to ask the questions to your pastors, parents, or your teachers. You can learn more about God through the questions. A second, just like Jesus, we can have more special connection with God when we are in church. Um, absolutely with your parents. Don't forget. Let us pray together. Dear God, thank you for loving us and thank you for teaching us. 
Help us to keep asking questions and growing in our faith. In your name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy to get to bring you our message and scripture passage today. This Sunday in the life of our church, we are celebrating our children. Um, in our in-person worship services, much of our worship will be led by our children. If you are wanting to see some of that, you can always, in addition to worshiping with us here on The Vine, check out our Facebook Live presentation uh, that you'll get to see some of the kids singing as well. Because we are in the midst of our series called Be Like Jesus, and because it's Children's Sabbath, I thought it would be fun for us to look at a story about Jesus when he was a child. And so our story today comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, beginning in verse 41. Hear now this word. Now every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we, your people, are longing today to hear a word from you. God, I pray that in this time you would use me to speak to your people. Lord, I pray that if there's anything that I say that isn't from you, please let it be instantly forgotten. But God, if there's anything that I say that is from you, please let it sink and root deeply into our hearts. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Growing up, I was lucky enough not only to have two older sisters who I loved, but also to have some cousins that I was really close with. Me and my sisters, Laura and Maddie, were especially close with our cousins, Rachel and Hannah, who lived about five hours away from our house in Ohio in Pennsylvania. They were right around the same age as us, and we had the best time visiting them a couple of times a year. But the worst part of that trip was always needing to say goodbye. So one year, we got an idea. What if we didn't have to say goodbye? What if we could somehow get Rachel and Hannah into the trunk of our parents' minivan and get all the way to Ohio without anyone noticing? We planned our mission with military precision. We thought of everything. First, Rachel and Hannah would put pillowcases over their heads while they walked to the minivan, so that anyone who noticed them would only see two pillows walking themselves to the car and not two kids. And once they were safely in the trunk, my sisters and I would volunteer to load the luggage so that our stowaways wouldn't be detected. Our parents would be so pleased that, they, that we were helping that they wouldn't even question a thing. Rest stops would be tricky, but not insurmountable. 
And once we made it all the way to Ohio, our parents would simply have no choice but to enroll Rachel and Hannah in our elementary school and let them live in our house. It was a foolproof plan. And children, I am not suggesting you try this at home. When it came time for us to leave, the family was confused. Where were Rachel and Hannah? They always stood outside and waved at the end of the driveway until our car was out of view. But my oldest sister, Laura, cleverly lied and said that Rachel and Hannah were just so sad that they were le we were leaving that they had already walked home. So we all piled into our car. Our stomachs were in knots as we began the journey, first out of the driveway, then out of the street that my grandparents lived on, and then out of their neighborhood and then past the gas station, and then almost to our exit to get onto the highway. All in all, it took about 30 minutes until my dad got a phone call. I could hear my Uncle Alan on the other end of the line saying, this is crazy, but we can't seem to find the girls. Is there any chance that they're with you? And my dad, in the type of voice that only a father can use, said, they better not be. I just asked my parents about this story to find out just how long it was before our plan was discovered. And my dad said that from his perspective, it was not that long, but also way too long at the same time. But however long it took my aunt and uncle to realize that their daughters were missing and to think to call my parents, it took Mary and Joseph a lot longer. In this story from Luke's Gospel, we get a glimpse into Jesus' life before he began his public ministry. In the story, Jesus is only 12 years old, which is the last official year of childhood in Judaism. Mary, Joseph, Jesus, and apparently lots of other friends and relatives have traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover in the Holy City. And after the festival, they pack up and head home. Only they forget something. Some one. Now, let's cut Mary and Joseph a little bit of slack here. It wasn't like it took them a full day to notice that there was an empty seat in the minivan. Because in the ancient world, people traveled in caravans. So picture multiple wagons, plus animals out and roaming and people walking. Joseph assumed that Jesus was, was with his mom, and Mary assumed he was with his dad. And maybe they thought that he was in one of the wagons with one of his buddies, or that he was hanging out with the donkeys. But at some point towards the end of the day, Mary and Joseph realize what has happened. Wait, Jesus isn't with you? No, I thought you had him. Hey, has anybody seen Jesus? They've already gone a full day's journey. So it takes them another day to get back into the city. And then it takes them three days to find where Jesus has been all along. And when they find him, he's somewhat surprised that they were even looking for him. He has been making himself perfectly at home, sitting in the temple, asking the rabbis all sorts of questions. I love this story so much in scripture because it reminds us that in addition to being fully God, Jesus is fully human. And that meant that he was a child and a preteen and a teenager. And there's so much that we can understand, not only about who God is, but who our young people are through this passage. Today, we're going to talk about a few things that were true of Jesus in this passage that are also true of our young people today. And we're going to discover how God is calling us to be more present with our youth and our children. First, I like to think about what it was that Jesus was doing for these three days. I don't know how much time you've spent around 12-year-old boys, but they need to eat, like a lot of food. How was it that Jesus was able to get food for the at least three, maybe five days that he was on his own? And where did he stay? 
Was he out in the cold at night? Or was he staying with someone? The only thing we can assume, based on Jesus' clear well-being and the swath of time that he was completely unsupervised in Jerusalem, is that he was cared for by adults other than his own parents. And just like Jesus, our kids today needs adults, need adults in their lives who love and support them in addition to their parents. A few weeks ago, I and several other folks on staff had the opportunity to, ch- to attend a church leadership conference in Kansas City. And one of our speakers was Kara Powell, who's the executive director of the Fuller Youth Institute, which is a branch of Fuller Theological Seminary in California. The Fuller Youth Institute conducts research about effective youth ministry and then uses that research to equip local churches. One of their research projects is called Sticky Faith. They wanted to understand why it was that so many young people stop practicing their faith after they leave high school. So they followed 227 high school seniors who were heavily involved in their youth groups throughout their college experience. And you know what they found? they discovered that one of the top predictors of whether that student would drift away from their faith during college was the presence of intergenerational relationships. Students who had supportive relationships with Christian adults who weren't family members were significantly more likely to stay engaged with their faith than those who didn't. Now, there's a common ratio for work with children and youth and that's one to five. You want one adult chaperone for every five children and youth. But the folks at the Fuller Youth Institute looked at their research and said, you know, actually we need to reverse that ratio. It isn't just that we need one adult chaperone for every five kids. Instead, actually every young person needs five adults who are invested in their life. Now, that doesn't have to mean five adults are leading Sunday school for every one kid who's in attendance. But instead, it means five adults who invest in each kid relationally, even in simple ways. It means meeting a kid and finding out that her name is Claire, and then remembering that her name is Claire, and maybe remembering to ask her how soccer practice is going. These kind of relationships make an incredible impact. I'm the product of these kinds of relationships, and I bet you are too. When I think about my experience growing up in the church, I don't remember a lot of sermons, and I don't even remember a lot of the specific Sunday school lessons. But I remember Ms. Jo, who led crafts at VBS every year and hugged me every time that I saw her at church. And I remember Mrs. Hartney, who used to save me one of her famous iced sugar cookies in the church kitchen because they would go so fast during fellowship hour. I remember Mr. Herman, who volunteered on mission trips and taught me how to use a saw. I remember Robin, who met me at Starbucks to talk about faith with me when I was in high school. Not only is building relationships with our young people effective for their faith journey, It's also what we have promised to do. In the United Methodist Church, we don't have private baptism ceremonies that take place at someone's house. Instead, baptisms happen here as a part of our worship service. And there's a reason for that, because baptism isn't just a covenant between the individual and God. It's also a covenant with the congregation. In a baptism, after the parents confess their faith in Jesus and promise to raise their child in the faith, I turn to you and ask, will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this child now before you in your care? And everyone responds with this promise. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround this child with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples 
who walk in the way that leads to life. These are important promises, and we have made them, and they matter. And we know that these kinds of relationships that are practiced even in simple ways have the impact to impact a child's faith formation for the rest of their life. We can see from Jesus' story that it's important for adults other than just parents to be in, involved in the life of a child. We also get to hear about all of the great questions that Jesus asked. Luke tells us that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. I think anyone who's spent any time at all with young people knows that kids love to ask questions. You know, as we get older, we start to think that we have things figured out and we have answers. And so it's really easy to get irritated with, say, a preschooler who's constantly asking questions. Why is the sky blue? Why does the moon follow our car? Why did you move that? Why do we have to leave? Just this week during our preschool chapel time, one little girl urgently interrupted what I happened to think was a very riveting telling of the story of Noah's Ark to ask why there's lights here on the ceiling. And then another wanted to know why there were, why there were flowers on the altar. And another child asks me every single week why my nails are the color that they are. Many of these questions no longer make sense to us as adults because we take the answers for granted. It is the way that it is because it is. But children are meaning-making machines, always hungry to understand the world around them, how it works and why it works that way. Children are naturally curious, and that curiosity is a spiritual superpower. In the midst of a disagreement between his disciples, Jesus said this, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I wonder if part of what Jesus was saying that children get right is their willingness to ask questions. Asking questions opens up space, space for new ideas, space to learn, and in my experience, space for God to move. I have the privilege of helping lead our confirmation class, which is made up of youth between seventh and ninth grade who are preparing to profess faith in Jesus for themselves. In our classes, we ask a lot of questions. This year, we even have a box called the Can I Ask That Box, where our youth can put in questions about faith anonymously that they might not want to ask out loud. We also make time to answer questions as we go in class. And whether these questions come written out in the box or spoken out loud, these questions rock. I'll always remember a time last year when one of our confirmands raised his hand and clearly a little bit embarrassed said, I'm sure that this is a stupid question, but if Jesus is the Son and God is the Father, then did Jesus come from God? Like, was there a time before Jesus when it was just God? I was so excited that I almost started jumping up and down. Because far from this being a stupid question, that's actually a question that so many early Christians had that the global church had to sit down and have a whole council meeting about it. We call it the Council of Nicaea, and it was really important in church history. And this year, multiple confirmands have anonymously asked the same question in different words. If God created everything, then who created God? That is one of the central questions that philosophy of religion professors ask. Without even trying, our kids and youth are asking the same questions that church fathers, academics, scientists, theologians, and philosophers have been asking for centuries. We, we make space for the questions of youth and children. We make sp space for God to move and for us to learn more about God as well. Jesus asked Christ questions, 
And our kids ask great questions too. Jesus also gave great answers. Scripture tells us that all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and at his answers. You know, in addition to asking great questions, our kids and youth also have really great answers. I thought it would be fun to hear what our kids have to say to us as adults. So last week in Sunday school, all of our kids were asked to write out what advice they would give to adults. And their responses were amazing. When I read through them on Monday morning, I was interested that there were so many common themes that kept coming up. Of the 51 kids who gave us their advice, 16 said something about worrying less or slowing down. One kid wrote this, a piece of advice I would give to adults is that there is more to life than bills, money, and the price of gas. Those things are obviously important, and I'm not saying that those are inconsequential, but taking a little time each day to try and remember what it was like to be a kid and to try to see the world through kids' eyes. Adults always claim to miss their youth, but they almost never try to reclaim it. Ouch! <laughs> and another 16 of those 51 asked adults to listen to kids and to actually try to understand their experience. One child wrote, listen to your kids before making an answer for yourself. Support your kids in everything. Don't get involved if your kid doesn't want you to. And another said, don't talk at kids, talk to kids. And another said, listen to your kids, they might have good ideas. And one kid put it very, very simply, listen to me and don't internet. Our young people are longing to be listened to. And just as those who sat with Jesus and heard his questions and then heard his answers were amazed at his teaching, I believe that we will also be amazed when we sit in the presence of our youth and children as they ask their questions and as they give their answers. Today, I want to invite you to a few different ways that you might come to be in relationship with the incredible kids and youth of our congregation. The first is maybe the most obvious, and that's to get involved through your time by being a faith keeper for our 412 youth on Sunday nights at the WU, or as a small group leader. Or you can teach Sunday school. I didn't know this until recently, but our Sunday school teachers don't have to create their own curriculum. Everything's given to you, and you don't have to teach every week. Instead, you can sign up to be in a rotation and teach maybe once a month. There are so many adults who have to come together to make our programming here at Wrightsville what it is for our children and youth. In fact, for one week of programming for our children and youth here, we need 52 adults to give their time. 52 adults every week. And that's not counting mission trips and special events. Could you be one of those 52? every couple of weeks? I know that might sound a little too intimidating right now. And so if that's the case, there's still other steps that you can take. One is to introduce yourself to a kid or a youth during fellowship hour or in a service or at another church gathering. Learn their name and remember it. Listen to them. Ask them about what happened at school, about their sports, about their favorite TV show, about whatever it is that they want to tell you about. You can make a difference just by being present. And finally, and most importantly, pray intentionally for our kids and our youth. This is part of what we have promised to do in our baptismal vows. You could choose a specific child that you know by name, or you could pray more generally for all of their well-being. As we close, I want to invite you to recommit to valuing our youth and children 
And we're going to do that by reciting together the promises that we've made at so many of these kids' baptisms. Will you join me now as we make this commitment together? The words for this will be on your screen. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround this child with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Would you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for all of our youth and for our children. God, we thank you for all that they have to teach. God, we thank you for the story that we've gotten to read that gives us a window into what Jesus was like when he was a kid. God, I pray that you would empower adults to be in the lives of young people, to believe that our presence can make an impact. And God, we pray for all of our kids and youth that they will come to know you, that they would have bravery to share their insights and their questions with those around them. And God, that you would give us ears to listen to what they say. We love you, God, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you go now from this place, may the spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way. Go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own. Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace. Hi, I'm Julia Walker Jewell. I'm the director of music here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And I've been here for 29 years. Um, that being said, it's time for me to pass the torch on to a new leader. So, at the end of this year, 2024, I'll retire, and uh, nothing has happened. Uh, it'd be easier to storm off mad rather than make the hard decision to leave this church family and staff that I know and love so well. But it's time. I'm ready for my next phase in life, and um, the church and the choirs are incredibly strong, and so I feel like... Um, God is preparing someone to take it over and things will continue booming here at Wrightsville. My family will be here. This is our home church. And so I just thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for the opportunity to serve here. Thank you. Thank you.